Amen. Keep your place there in Proverbs chapter 18. We'll get there in just a minute. Proverbs 18 is a chapter where you could preach about 50 sermons out of just this one chapter. But we're just going to look at one verse, which is the verse of the week in your bulletin this morning. And just to give you a little context of what we're going to talk about um, this morning, we're going to talk about this idea. Uh, well, we're going to look at relationships uh, this morning. All right. We're going to look at relationships this morning. Now, um, one thing that you will realize if you understand just a little bit about the Bible, there's a lot of confusion about relationships today, whether it be friendships or relationships between men and women. And one thing that you will see from, you know, looking at things I've preached on, like the manosphere before and all this type of thing, but what this is is this, you know, it's, it's people taking advantage of a couple of truths in relationships and then, you know, causing a lot of confusion, really. But if you listen to secular advice on relationships, especially relationships between men and women, if you listen to secular advice and, you, and then on top of that, you know what the Bible says, you will quickly, quickly realize that people out there with this secular thought process and looking at relationships from the male perspective and the female perspective, they are never going to get to the truth. There is no solution there. And I'm actually a little bit surprised that the Bible, even some of the more common things in the Bible are not brought up in these types of, the Bible has given no credence or credibility today, even in casual secular conversations. They'll quote all kinds of different people and all these things, but never use the Bible. But the truth is in the Bible. And without the Bible, you are never going to reach um, that um, proper conclusion. I mean, I, I, I worry about the future generations because there's no chance when you look at what both sides are saying here, whether it be men or women. They may notice certain things that are true and natural, but they're never going to come to the proper conclusions unless they know the truth of what the Bible says. And what the, with the proof of this, the proof of this is in what's actually happening. And what I want to talk about this morning is this idea of loneliness. People that feel lonely, people that are alone, or at least they feel that they are alone. It's a huge problem today. And a lot of the, you know, all the, the single people now are saying, oh, is this going to be about single people? No, actually, this is probably going to be more about marriage this morning because, you know, I come at it from the perspective of someone who is married. <coughs> so the statistics today are fairly shocking. 40% of single people, when polled, say that they are lonely, 40%. All right, 40% of single people out there, look, I'm talking friendships, I'm talking, you know, relationships with, you know, the opposite sex. 40% of single people are lonely in the United States today. And you say, well, uh, of course, turn to Genesis chapter 2. You say, well, of course, they're lonely because they're not married. And this is just going to be all about, you know, being single and, you know, how to not be single and how to get married or whatever. Well, maybe a little bit. But here's another shocking statistic for you. 20% of married people poll and say that they are lonely. All right? And the reason for this is that just because you are married does not mean that that relationship is good. So obviously it is possible to be married and then have a relationship that is not good inside that marriage and still be Married. This is unfathomable to the, to the secular world because the secular world today thinks, well, if you get married and then you don't have a good relationship, you just, just stop being married. You know, that's what people think today. But there are plenty of people out there that will just remain married. They will not get married. They have that character about, they will not get divorced. They have that character about them. And then, I mean, how many people, just to give you a show of hands, how many People have you known in your life that have a, that are married and are never going to not be married, but have a bad relationship inside that marriage. I mean, I have seen that several times in my life. All right, look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 18. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 18. So the Bible says, and the Lord God said, it is not good for the man that, that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. So this is when God made Eve, and Adam, you know, got married. So look, what the Bible is telling us here is two things. First of all, the Bible is saying that marriage should solve this loneliness problem. And if 
if you get married and have, you know, do what God says, and we're going to talk about that um, this morning, in that marriage, you will not be lonely. You won't be a, a lonely person. So, I mean, marriage should solve it. So if you're single this morning, and the Bible is saying it is not good that the man should be alone, so, you know, the answer for the man that is lonely is to go and get a wife. So he should go get one. That's what the Bible says. But look, these principles that I want to talk to you about this morning will not only help you get a wife, but it will help the marriage itself have a proper, good relationship so you don't find loneliness even inside marriage, which is very possible. I mean, think about it. One in five marriages today, people say that they are lonely. I mean, that's, that's sad that somebody is married and then they are lonely inside their marriage. So there's an epidemic today of loneliness. So the title of the sermon this morning is this. So when you look at all these lonely people, I'm going to tell you this morning how they became lonely. I'm going to tell you this morning how these people, the 40% of single people and the 20% of married people, I'm going to explain to you from the Bible how these people became lonely. You say, how can you say that? Because you don't know these people, you don't know every person. I guarantee you, according to the Bible, Anybody that is lonely today, it is a combination of one of these three things that I'm going to tell you about this morning. So I'm going to give you three things this morning on how to be lonely. And obviously, if you know the book of Proverbs, if we apply the opposite of those things, you will not be lonely. All right? So I'm going to show you three things. The first one, if you look down at Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 24, this is a very common verse, a very well-known verse that I've preached on before, but just looking at it from the perspective of being alone or loneliness, look at Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 24. And I want you to keep your place in Proverbs 18 because I want to go to another verse a little bit later in Proverbs 18 when I make a different point. But the first point is this, if you want to be lonely, be a jerk. Be a jerk, and you will be lonely. Look at Proverbs 18, verse number 24. The Bible says, A man that hath friends <coughs> excuse me, must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So this is saying that a friendly person will have friends. I mean, you say, well, man, what is that, rocket science? But here's the thing. Why are people jerks then? You know, why are people jerks to people around them? Why are people jerks? inside of marriage. Why are people rude and crude and harsh inside, you know, relationships? If you are a jerk inside your relationships, whether it be your friends, <coughs> your spouse, or whoever, you are going to end up lonely. That's what the Bible here is saying in verse number 24 of Proverbs 18. Look at Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 24. Again, proving the same point here, the Bible is literally telling people, don't be friends with people like that. The Bible is literally warning the good people, the people that aren't rude, that aren't mean. The Bible calls this the angry man. The Bible is saying that if there's an angry man, somebody who is what I call in the, the, the first point here, a jerk, stay away from that person. Look at verse number 24. <coughs> the Bible says, make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man, thou shalt not go. I mean, look, just think about, just think about, somebody made a comment out soul winning on Thursday. We're out soul winning on Thursday, and it wasn't a very receptive neighborhood. And there were some rude people, and somebody made a comment, the, the girls, and I've made this comment about the, the ladies many times, but somebody made a specific comment, like, you know, because we were kind of having a rude time on our side of the street, and, you know, the girls and were over there. I think Miss Nancy was talking to somebody. And, and uh, one of the guys made a comment like, yeah, well, nobody could be rude to Miss Nancy. And, and it's, you know, but here's the thing. Every single person that's been out soul winning has sent somebody rude to them. Even the ladies, even Miss Nancy, even the people you would look at and say, nobody could be rude to them. Because there's just angry men out there. There's just people out there who are just rude. I mean, look, I mean, if I think this all the time when there's, when there's angry people that you run into, but look, I mean, just think about this. If you think Christians are the problem, 
If you look at this world today and you think the Christians are the problem, you're an angry man. That's an angry man right there. But look, here's what you have to understand about those people and what the Bible is telling us in context of the sermon <coughs> this morning. Those are lonely people. That angry man, it, look, nobody wants to be around that person. Nobody wants to be around that angry man that you work with, that angry person that you work with. In general, in general, people like to avoid people like that. And that's what we don't want to be. So you want to be lonely? Be a jerk. I mean, look, turn to Proverbs chapter 1. <coughs> look at Proverbs chapter 1. Look at verse number, 22, uh, verse number 22. You're like, we need to beware. Because one thing about negative people in general is they're always looking for people to recruit. Negative people are always looking to recruit people. But look at what the Bible says in verse number 22. So hopefully, if everyone's listening to the Bible, the negative person will be avoided and the negative person will be alone. And if you don't want to be by yourself, don't be a negative person. Don't be rude. Don't be a jerk. Don't be that angry man. But look at verse number 22 of uh, Proverbs chapter 1. The Bible says, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning. Notice how it, said, it shows that connection there between scorners, people that are constantly negative, People that are always just, you know, scorning everything and everybody. And what are they after? They're, they're, with, they're, they're, they're gathering from the simple. They're gathering from the simple. They're gathering from people that aren't aware of what's happening. Smart people, people that know what the Bible says, people that have knowledge and wisdom, they avoid those types of people like the plague. That's why if you're smart and you start a new job somewhere, you start, and you, look, you better just, look, I guarantee you those people, the scorers, are there. And you better get good at identifying who they are because those scorners are going to try to pull in simple people. But if it's all just a bunch of smart, knowledgeable people, the scorner will be by themselves, and that's where they should be, all right? So look, I mean, these are people that are just complainers. They're just complainers. They're negative about everything. People, I mean, they have nothing good to say, ever. Don't be that person, is what the Bible is saying. Or people won't want to be around you. It's very, very simple. Turn to Proverbs chapter 21. Turn to Proverbs chapter number 21. It is a, look, it's a, it's a common hole that people fall into. And it's a really stupid hole to fall into. It's one of the simplest traps that people, I mean, that's why the Bible calls them simple ones. If you fall into that trap, you're a simple one. All right, let's look at it in the context of marriage. Don't be a jerk inside your marriage. Well, you know, here, now here's a, a, a common misconception, and one that I hope I can get across. Um, I've mentioned this before, and I want to mention it again, but here's a mistake that people make inside marriage. People read the Bible, and they, they read the role of the husband in the Bible, and they read the role of the wife in the Bible, and then they go ahead and they assume that whether they fulfill their role depends on the performance of the other, and it does not. There is nothing in the Bible that says the role of the husband or the role of the wife depends on whether or not the wife or the husband or the other spouse is doing what their role is. Your duty, according to the Bible, is always independent of the performance of the other. Do not forget that. Look, a no relationship will work if you don't understand that simple fact. All right, we'll get into that in the second case. But look at Proverbs <coughs> chapter 21. We're talking about just being rude, being a jerk, being an angry person. The Bible says this with the wives. Look at Proverbs 21, 19. The Bible says in Proverbs 21, 19, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry, look at that word, angry woman. In verse number 9 of the same chapter, it says that it is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a contentious woman. So the Bible here is giving advice 
to the woman. It is saying, don't be contentious, don't be angry. Now let me ask you a question. Does it say why she's angry? It does not. What if she's angry for a good reason? What if the husband's being an idiot? What if the husband's being a fool? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's, not, it's saying that independent of what the husband is doing, that it is not, if the wife is angry, contentious, nagging, because look, many times the, the wife, the woman becomes that way, and it may be legitimately wrong things that the husband is doing. But the, what the Bible is saying is it is not her place to become the angry woman, to become the contentious woman, because all that is going to do is assure that she is what? Alone. Because when the husband's in the wilderness or hiding in the corner of the attic, she's by herself. She's alone. She does not have that companionship. <coughs> it doesn't say what she was contentious about because it's not important. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 16. It just says that if she becomes angry and she becomes contentious, like, and this is, this is, a, this is a, a, good, a great piece of advice for young ladies looking for a husband. Don't marry somebody that's just doing a bunch of wrong things with the idea that you're going to fix him. Oh, he's got all these uh, sins that he's dealing with, and that's okay, I'll fix him. No, you, you know, you're risking becoming a Proverbs 21 Woman, you want to be a Proverbs 31 woman, not a Proverbs 21 woman. All right? So it does not say what the husband is doing. It does not matter. It is not the place of her to become angry and contentious and be nagging at her. It is not her place to put herself in authority over him. And look, that's the problem with a young lady thinking she's going to marry some young man that is into all kinds of bad things and just think I'm going to fix him is that she doesn't have that God-given authority to do, be the fixer. It is not her place and it's not going to work because she doesn't have that God-given authority. Look at verse number 16 of Proverbs, or 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at what the Bible says here. I mean, a man shouldn't be contentious either. It's not just talking about, you know, women in the Bible. Look, it says, if any man seemed to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Like the Bible is saying, like, you know, that's why, you know, if you ever, you know, heard of like a guy who's just like super angry all the time and super upset all the time and just wants to argue constantly and people are just like, stay away from that guy. That's what the Bible is saying. Stay away from that guy. Like everything, the guy where you can't talk about anything because it goes from zero to a thousand, you know, and just like everything becomes an argument. It's just best just to stay away from that person. It's best just to avoid that situation in general. Now, here's a special case. So, look, point number one in not being lonely is don't be a jerk, both men and women. Don't be a contentious person, or you are going to be alone because people that are smart and have wisdom and people that sh you should want to be around are going to want to have nothing to do with you. And if you do find someone to be around as a contentious you know, angry person, they're going to be simple people. They're going to be simple people. But here's a special case. Here's a special case that I've seen a couple of times in my life. It's a simple case where a married couple becomes contentious together. Maybe they, they you know, what they do is they use each other to do nothing but complain and be contentious about other people. And this is dangerous as well. This is poor leadership in the household right here. If you lead your wife down this path, because, look, if there is a married couple and all they do is complain about other people outside their house, all these different things, and even though they may get along, they will ruin their children, first of all. They will ruin their children because they will raise contentious, cynical, you know, children who are nothing but complainers and contentious, angry people. But, you know, they will, they will have also no friends. They will have no friends at all. Turn to Philippians chapter number 4. <coughs> Turn to Philippians chapter number 4. 
So what's the opposite of this? What is the opposite of you know, being contentious, being angry? If I don't want to be lonely, what's the opposite? Well, look at Philippians chapter 4 and look at verse number 8. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 8. You should lead your wife into good things. You should not lead your wife down this path where we just criticize everything. This is where, you know, men, when they, when they lead their home, they don't necessarily need to speak out loud every single thing that they're thinking. Because what they need to understand is though they may notice things and, you know, see things in the world or at work or whatever it is, they don't need to burden their family with all of these different things because they will do damage to those in their family. They can, you could turn a contentious man, you know, it's better to not say anything if you're having contentious feelings than to lead your family down that road. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 8. Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 8. The Bible says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, okay, so, you know, tell the truth, understand the truth. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, but now look at this. Whatsoever things are of good report. You see that? Meaning, you ever heard, you know, if there be, look, and then look at the next few verses. <coughs> if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, you know what that is saying? That is saying, whatsoever things are of good report, it's not saying if there be someone that's virtuous, if there be someone that is worthy of praise. It's saying, if, find the praise. It's saying, find the virtue. And it's saying, whatsoever things are of good report. You ever heard the, if you have nothing nice to say? <coughs> Excuse me, I think I'll be coughing <coughs> for the rest of my life. It's saying, whatsoever things are of good report, meaning if you don't have anything to say, it's better to not say anything. And then it's saying, with people, with situations, if there's any virtue, if there's anything to praise, it's saying, focus on the good things. It's saying, think on these things. Because how do you become contentious with your words? How do you become contentious just in your life in general? Because you're just constantly thinking negative things. And then those are the things that come out of your mouth. So the Bible is saying, focus on good. Like, say there's somebody that just, say there's somebody that just like annoys the living daylights out of you. And maybe they annoy you for good reason. But look, you're, you're supposed to focus on the good things. Focus on the good things. Like, nobody's all completely bad. People have good qualities and bad qualities. <coughs> Excuse me. Focus on the good is what the Bible is saying. Think about the good things. And then your heart will change. And look, you won't be talking about nothing except negative things. So the first thing is be a positive person. If you want to be a jerk and be negative and be contentious and be angry, you're going to be lonely more than likely in your life even in your marriage, the Bible is saying. The second one is this. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. So the first one is if you want to be lonely, be a jerk. Find me a nice, I mean, find me a nice, positive person that is always smiling, that always has a good attitude, and find me one of, I mean, just the first point alone. Find me that positive person, that person that major trouble comes and they're like, I think we can work around this by doing this and everything's going to be okay and all this. Find me that person and I'll show you somebody that has got a lot of people around them. I'll show you somebody that, want, that people want to be around. People want to be around people with positive attitudes like that. People that are constantly just looking at the good in people. They can always find something to compliment in somebody. It's not always find something to appreciate in somebody, even somebody that's flawed, which we all are. Look at Colossians chapter 3. <coughs> Look at verse number 12. Here's the second one. If you want to be alone, have unreasonable expectations for people. 
Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse number 12. The Bible says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and here we go, long-suffering. Now look at this one here. Forbearing one another. You know what forbearing one another means? Forbearing means that when you have reason to be angry with somebody, you have reason to be upset with somebody, you just, you look past it. You forbear. It doesn't, forbearing means there was something that was undesirable there, but you chose to move past it. You chose to have grace in the situation. See, the problem with people is this. The problem with people in general is this, is that people think so highly of themselves and then they only focus on the failures of others. That's a major problem with people in general. I mean, just think of the Christian life. Just think of the Christian life. Look, we're all growing. I don't care where you are in the Christian life. We all, including myself, are growing in this Christian life. We're all, hopefully, growing in this Christian life, but nobody is there. Nobody's at the finish line in this Christian life. There's always going to be the need to show some grace with people. There is always going to be that need. Even in a church, in the Christian life, everybody should be growing. Especially, think about this. People that maybe got saved later in life and are getting things right as adults. They're getting things right. Maybe they're changing an entire family as adults. Look, that is, I mean, you think about uh, just think about a marriage again. Think about a marriage and think about, I mean, just aside from the Christian life, just think about new chapters in life. Just think about new babies. Think about first baby. Think about extra babies. Think about new children coming in and, and just like you have the need to show grace with each other as husband and wife. I mean, you think about, I mean, I think, I remember you know, changing the standards of my family after getting saved and realizing like I need to change some things in this family, not only with myself, but the standards of our family, where we go, where we don't go, things that we, uh, you know, let into our home, you know, whether it be media, movies, all these different things, all these new beliefs, you know, with Christian growth comes new standards from those beliefs. All that knowledge of the Bible comes new standards. You read the Bible, you understand what God wants, what he doesn't want. You're like, oh, you translate that to your actual life. I need to change that. Well, guess what? Change is hard and everybody needs to come along. And it's not just going to be this smooth process where everybody just comes along perfectly. No problem. I mean, from the perspective of a marriage, no wife will be perfect ever. No wife will be perfect. She will, she will struggle. She will struggle staying home. I mean, look, especially if she didn't stay home before. And now she wants to follow the Bible and become that keeper at home. That is not a simple transition. That is something that is difficult to throw off that culture that has been ingrained and indoctrinated into all of us. It's, look, it's a transition to keeping a home. It's a transition. I mean, homeschooling, it's not easy. It's, and look, on top of the fact that it's not easy, it is a huge responsibility. Amen. And the, the wives and the women and the women that, that do this and know what I'm talking about, <clears throat> they feel the weight of that responsibility. They feel the weight of that and look, there will be days if your wife homeschools your kids, if she's going to homeschool your kids in the future, if your future wife is going to homeschool your kids. Let me just tell you, there will be days where she feels like she is failing. There will be days where it feels like it is more than she can handle. And look, husbands need to understand that. 
And husbands need to give some grace in those situations. And they need to give some support in those situations. With all these things that the Christian life demands, we, we need to show grace even inside, especially inside our own marriages. Because no wife has it all figured out, and no husband has it all figured out, which is my next point. No husband, <coughs> no husband's going to do this perfectly. No husband is going to be that perfect provider. No husband is going to, you know, look. <coughs> and, you know, here's the thing that you need to understand from this sermon. The, the ladies just have to accept by faith that they can't understand the perspective of the husband. And the husbands need to ex just accept by faith that they can't understand the perspective of their wife. They just need to listen to what the Bible says. They just need to listen to what their wife is saying. They need to listen to what her husband is saying, and they just need to accept that perspective. But look, no husband will be perfect. It is, it is a battle out there. I mean, it is going out and supporting a family on a single income today, being that, per, you know, that, that husband, being that support system. <coughs> it's a war out there. I mean, it is, I think about just the last, you know, 25 years and I think about the, the things that I've, I've dealt with, the, the accomplishments and the failures and the people and the struggles. And, and, and uh, women need to understand that it is, it is war outside in the world trying to provide for a family. Maybe even your husband loses his job at some point. And that's like, thank God I, I've never had that happen to me. But I have heard, I've read that that is one of the most devastating things that can happen to a man is being laid off, losing his job. So no husband is going to be that perfect support system. Women need to, wives need to show some grace. No husband is going to say the right thing in the right way every single time. It's just, it's an impossible standard. <coughs> it's an impossible standard. So we need to show as husbands and wives we need to show some grace to one another. And all the people that are single, like, like you need to think about your standards of, you know, who you're looking for in, in, you know, for in a marriage. And look, you also need to not have impossible standards for a future spouse. Obviously, we're not to be unequally yoked. I'm not talking about marrying somebody who's unsaved or something extreme like that. But, you know, both men and young women need to not have impossible standards to, I mean, you'll find young people who have absolutely impossible standards. And what does that equal? It means they're going to be alone. That's what it means. And people, they just have too high of standards, and they need to show people some grace. Turn to Philippians chapter number 2. Turn to Philippians chapter number 2. <coughs> Here's the last one. But it's, it's a big one. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Here's what people don't realize about relationships. Between friends, between spouses, whatever kind of relationship that we're talking about, people don't understand that the more you are focused on yourself in a relationship, the worse that relationship will be. So the third way to ensure that you are lonely is to be obsessed with yourself. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 4. The Bible says this, says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of other. This is the key to successful relationships of all kinds right here. The more you can be focused on the other person in the relationship, the stronger the relationship will be. Friends, marriages, whatever it is. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Turn to Ephesians chapter number 5. So, again, this proves my point. Philippians chapter 2 Proves my point. You're turning to Ephesians chapter 5, but it proves my point that marriage, marriage is really, it seems counterintuitive, but marriage is about the perception of the other person. And I want to explain that to you. You say, I don't understand what you just said. Well, read Ephesians, look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 25. You've read, you've heard this verse many times, but look what it says. And we're going to focus here on, you know, what the, ha what, what, what condition would mean that a wife is happy in a marriage. Look at verse number 25. It says, Husbands, 
love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So right there it says, husbands, love your wives. Now here's the problem in marriages. A husband, 100% of the time, if you would walk up to a husband and you would say, like, any husband that you know, whether he's got a good relationship or a bad relationship in his marriage, if you would walk up to that guy, I guarantee you, almost 100% of the time, if you said, do you love your wife? He would say yes. But the problem is, is that he is not really loving his wife according to how Christ loved the church. And if he was loving his wife, according to how Christ loved the church, she would feel like she was loved. She would know, is a better way to say it, that she was loved. See, the problem is, you'll go out there and if you would survey marriages, and you would ask husbands, do you love your wife? 100% of husbands would say, of course I do. Of course I love my wife. And then if you go ask those same wives, does your husband love you? Do you feel loved by your husband? I bet you the, the number would be a lot lower. Because just because you're thinking, of course I love my wife, guess what? Her perception matters. So in these two examples that I'm going to give you inside of marriage here, you don't get to grade your own test. You don't get to check your own work. It only matters. Look, it doesn't matter if you say, oh, I love my wife. If she doesn't know that, or especially feel like she is loved, you are not doing Ephesians chapter 5 and the, the three verses that I just read you. It's her perspective that matters. And the answer to how to actually show that love where she will receive it is to sacrifice for her. That's what that means when it compares Christ to the church to how you should be with your wife. It's to sacrifice for her. Sacrifice what? Everything and anything, whatever necessary, up to and including your life. And I've said this before, like if you, if you can't sacrifice for somebody and you are the most important person in your life and you can't think ever of giving your life for something other than saving your own, you should not get married. You should remain single. It's talking about sacrificing. That's what providing and protecting is. It's sacrificing. Most men probably don't enjoy going to work every day. They do it to provide and protect their family, to support their family physically, look, and emotionally. That's why you shouldn't be this angry, contentious man, because that's the opposite of providing that emotional support for the weaker vessel, which is your life. You should be telling your wife, even at times, even at times where you're not sure if things are going to be okay, you should be calming your wife, sacrificing, and just being like, look, everything is going to be okay. Even if you're scared and you're worried inside, you should be telling your family, your wife and your children, that everything is okay. Look, even if you're not sure if it is. Just knowing the fact that you are going to go out there and sacrifice and make it okay. Amen. Look, the more self-sacrificing a husband is, the more loved a wife will know that she is. That, that's, that's it. Look, that's why, that's why, look, I don't think that a husband should do, you know, selfish things. I think that even, you just take something simple like men's hobbies. I don't think that a married, look, this is my opinion. This isn't in the Bible. This is my opinion. You take this or leave this. I don't think that a married man should be going out and doing things without his, you know, his, at least his children or his family. I don't think that you should have a, I stopped, I'll give you an example. I stopped bow hunting when I had kids because I, I had uh, a wife and now children at home and I'm just like it just didn't feel right to go out and just sit by myself for hours 
So I started doing things. This is, how I, this is really where I started fishing when the kids came along. And I remember fishing with all the kids when they were little. And like literally, you go out and you know what? It's, it's a little bit more fun fishing if you literally just want to catch fish when your kids are more fun by yourself or with your friends. Because all you do with little kids when they're fishing is untangle lines. Like, I literally went out, my wife would be, how was fishing? All I did was untangle lines and then, you know, Garrett's pole, literally it fell off the bridge into the water and like we don't know where it is and it's gone. And like literally I am an expert at untangling knots. Expert. Expert level. But you should not have hobbies that leave your wife and children behind. It should at least be, even like we would go out and fly these little model planes and like you know, even Garrett, when he was a little kid, would come with me, and like he didn't really understand. Like I'd build these things in the house and go out, and he just loved when I'd smash them up, and like it, they'd all crash. And he was just like, "Yeah, that's great," but it, at least it was something where the kids were there, all right. So the more self-sacrificing a husband is, and the less selfish he is, the more his wife will feel loved. It's about the other person, is this last point. Look, women literally need that from men. Even if they say they don't, they need that. They need a self-sacrificing husband to feel like he loves her. Like, I love you. Here's some flowers. You know, and I'm not saying don't get flowers for your wife, but I'm saying it's the self-sacrificing action that's going to make her feel and know that she's loved. That's what it is. And look, I, I mean, my wife and I were talking about this a week. And like we were just going back and forth on like the things that men need and the things that women need. And you can't understand this as a man. You can't understand it. Because guess what? You're a man. Guess what? You're not a woman. You're never going to be one. No matter what the world says. You can't understand it. You just have to listen to what the Bible says. But here's what you need to understand. That desire, what Ephesians 5.25 is saying, that desire to be loved... What you can understand is the things that you need. And I'm going to go into that next. So men, I want you to think about this for a second. And ladies, you think about it the other way. When I tell you about the things that men need, you understand that that desire for you to have these things that I'm going to tell you you need is just as strong for the woman to need that love, that self-sacrificing love from her husband. It's just as strong. It's just something different. So when you think about the things, I'm going to tell you these things, and all the men are going to nod their head. They're going to be like, yeah, that's exactly what I want. That's exactly what I need from my wife. And you think about how much you desire those things. And let me tell you something. The, as, you know how much I desire these things I'm going to go through? They're literally priceless to me. I would sell them for nothing. I would give them away for nothing in this world. That's how strong that desire for a wife to know that her husband loves her is. So that's how you understand things as a man when you're not a woman. And that's how you understand things as a woman when you're not a man. Women, you look at desire, how much you desire your husband to have that self-sacrificing love for you, and that is how much he needs these things I'm about to tell you. <coughs> because guess what? His perspective also matters. Good news, though. Men are much simpler. <coughs> Turn back to Ephesians chapter 5 if you left there. <coughs> Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 33. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 33. See, I told you it wasn't just about the single people. This is super important. If you can be alone inside a marriage, folks. It is important to have that strong relationship inside a marriage. Being married, it's not like, got married, I'm there. No, it is important to build this strong relationship. And look, it is a great blessing in your life. Look at verse number 33. It says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, got that one, even as himself, and now the wife, look at this, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. You say, well, of course. So the first one is this. He, he just wants respect. Your husband wants respect from the wife. And you say, well, of course I respect him. Well, that's the same thing as the husband that says, and then, so you ask every wife out there, well, maybe not everyone would answer this way, but if you ask wives, I, I imagine most wives would say, yeah, I respect my husband. Maybe some wouldn't. 
But I bet you a lower number of men would say, yeah, my wife respects me. You know, do you act and speak to him like you do? Is the question for the ladies. See, because you don't get to grade your own test. It's his perspective that matters. If you say that you respect your husband, but then you're contentious and you act and you speak to him like you don't have any respect for him and you take everything that he does for granted and all these things, you get too used to the things that he does and he provides, it will make him feel unbalanced. It will make him feel like you do not respect for him. Look, compliments from wives like mean a lot to men. Like it mean, it's a big deal. Turn to Proverbs chapter 31. Here's the second one. Here's the second one. Here's the second one. Look at Proverbs chapter 31 and look at verse number 11. Proverbs chapter 31 and verse number 11. This is talking about the, the virtuous woman right here, like the, 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 you know, the proverbial, the little proverbial perfect Christian wife right here in, in Proverbs 31. But look at verse number 11. It says, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. Now look, I get that husband and wife need to trust each other, and you know, infidelity, adultery in, on both sides is, is terrible, condemned in the Bible. I don't believe that that's what this is talking about. This is talking about him trusting that she has his back. This is talking about him trusting that as he's out there fighting that battle, you know, he's out there fighting forward and dealing with garbage that, thank God, his wife doesn't have to deal with. He's out there facing front, dealing with that, decade after decade, supporting, providing, protecting. He doesn't have to worry about his back. He knows that his wife that's doing all these things in Proverbs 31 has his back. And he trusts her. He just knows she's out there. Look, you ever heard a, a woman that is, that is bad talking her husband? It's the most terrible thing ever that can happen. Look, don't get me wrong. I've heard husbands bad talking their wives, but I've heard many more wives bad talking their husbands. And, and here's the thing, even if it was 50-50, who does it more, that's not even the point. It is devastating to the man. Devastating. Because a husband that can't trust his wife, I hear wives, like whether it be out in the workforce or wherever it's been, where their husband's not around and they're bad talking their husband. This is, this, here's advice that I give to, I'll give to all young married couples or couples before they even get married. So listen up. When you get married, don't you ever trash your wife or tra don't you ever say anything negative about your wife and wives, don't you ever say anything negative about your husband to anyone. If you have problems with your marriage, don't you go calling your parents and trashing your husband. Don't you go calling your parents and trashing your wife. That is so wrong and will do so much damage to that relationship. You could be lonely inside your marriage if you do those things. You got problems inside your marriage, you come together and deal with those things. You come together and you sit down with the Bible and you can sit down with your pastor or whoever and, and you deal with those things. But don't you go and trash your spouse to anybody else out in the world. Look, let me tell you something. Go back to Proverbs chapter 31, look down at verse number 11. That being said, and I should probably tell my wife this more. I know I have told her this many times, but I should tell her this more. The feeling of knowing that as I am out there fighting and learning and struggling and gaining skills so I can be better at providing and protecting and just dealing with the garbage that we will deal with as men out in this world and becoming what we need to be to be that provider and supporter and pro protector. I mean, just all the, I think about all the challenges and, and failures and accomplishments and failures and failures and failures and getting up again and, you know, starting new jobs and, you know, all these different things. 
but the feeling of knowing that my children, through all that, my children are home with my wife, learning and safe in the home is priceless. Priceless. It is something that I could never describe to her how priceless, it is, how priceless that is to me. That fact that, I, can, that I, I safely trust in her. All I have to do is deal with this stuff. I know that the important stuff is okay. There's no amount of money. It seems silly to even compare it to money. These people that are taking their wife and, se and sending them into the workforce and sending their kids to be raised by other people, they are selling this. They are selling something that I, I couldn't even put a price on. If, if look, if we were broke, if we were broke and it all went wrong, and maybe it will, we sell the cars, we sell the house, we sell everything. And you know what? The fact that my wife could go and get a job, that's extremely monetarily valuable. And most people realize this. My wife could go to work. If that ever happened, I would never sell it. I would never sell that. It, it's, it's literally, it literally, like I said, to put a dollar value on it is appalling to me. That's how valuable. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 31, in the first couple verses, it says that her value is more than rubies. It doesn't say, she, oh, she's a pile of rubies. No, it's more. It's more. Because safely trusting, because that husband, he safely trusts. And who's that, who's that mom talking to in Proverbs 31? She's talking to her son. She's saying that having a wife that you can safely trust in there's no amount of money. How sad is it? Think about this. How sad is it that, what, 80% of people now are selling something that the men in this room, could, they could not even, if you forced them to, put a price on? How crazy is that when you think about it that way? Look, this trust loyalty thing for men, let me go back to that just for a second. This trust loyalty thing for men, even amongst friends, if they have it from anyone, they will slay dragons for that person. If a man has a friend that he trusts, he, he, will, he will slay dragons for it. So I kind of like, you know, these two things are all that, that men need. It's kind of like, why, you know, I'm kind of happy that my wife knew me and my wife met me and said she would marry me, like, when I had nothing. All she had was hope. <laughs> <laughs> but look, these two things, respect and trust, is all men need. So look, maybe it's a good idea to go home today and ask your wife. Sit her down, put the kids somewhere else, sit her down and just say, do you, do you know that you are loved? And do you feel that way day to day in this marriage? And then have the wife ask the direct question back to her husband saying, do you, do you know that I respect you? And do you trust me? And do you feel that way every day? Th those, are, those are two good questions just to ask each other. Do that today sometime. Or tomorrow when you're at home or whatever it is. Because look, it doesn't matter if you think that you're doing it well. It is her perspective that matters for this thing that she must have. And it is his perspective that matters for this thing that he must have. Ask those questions. Mar hey, marriage, solved. You don't have to watch, you know, whatever. All these idiots on YouTube. Just the Bible. 
the, your relationships, the more, all your relationships, your friendships, the more they are about the other person, friendships as well, the stronger they will be. It is that simple. So look, here's a conclusion. I'm getting kind of long-winded here, but here's the thing. Be nice if you don't want to be lonely. Be a positive person. Number two, show some grace with people. Don't be this ultra person that is just ready to snap on people, ready to just point out every single flaw that your friends or your spouse have. Don't hold people to impossible standards. Churches are the same thing. Look, this church, here's what I can guarantee you. This church will operate according to the Bible. And that's why the standards that many of you that I've talked um, from the pulpit about many times, I've, I've talked to the guys about, that's why the standards are here in the church. Because that's my way of ensuring that this church operates according to the Bible. And, but look, churches are full of people. So we've got to show some grace with each other. There, there's no, you can't just, you know, you can't just be this ultra, you know, person that comes in. is like, if everybody's not perfect in this church, like, I'm out of here. There's people that just find a problem with every single church. There's a problem with every single church because these churches are full of people with problems. And there's no pastor that's perfect. And there's no um, usher's ministry that's perfect. There's no church leaders that are perfect. There, there's, there's no people that are perfect. So show some grace. If you want to have good relationships, show some grace. And then the last one is just, you know, think of others before yourself. Don't be a taker, basically. If, like, all your life is is just people giving to you, and you're nothing but a taker, that means, you know what that means? That means you have friends, but you aren't a friend. That's what the Bible is saying there. That means that there's people, and look, churches are common for that. Churches are common for that because our master is right here. Our master, you won't find a lot of secular friendships like that because people would just be like, this isn't worth it for me. Just like doing everything for this person constantly. But you'll find that in churches, even though you shouldn't be like that, you'll find that in churches because there's a higher obligation. Because people are serving God. And God tells them to serve you. But that doesn't mean you should just sit there and just be a taker in your life. So look, there's a lot of lonely people out there. But if you're nice, if you're graceful, and you're selfless, you won't be one of them. That's what the Bible's teaching us here. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.